Um, this will be a set of three presentations, I heard. Um, um, I have not talked to the other ones doing the presentations. Um, I'm actually quite interested in if we sync up in the details. Um, because um, user land networking is something that everybody talks about, um, everybody does, but not a lot of people um, say what they actually do and how they implement their solutions. So, um, we begin and try to do a little bit of what user land networking actually is. Um, I've looked it up on Wikipedia. There is no entry there. Maybe we should change that. Um, but anyway, um, we talk about the biggest problem, which is bottlenecks. Um, zero copy um, is kind of interlaced with that. Um, then we talk about frameworks that are available right now and architectures that are actually employed then on top of these frameworks. The last little bit is uh, uh, something, something about how can we use user land networking uh, in the future. And there is a very cool use case that I'm going into quickly. And then obviously some more reading material. Um, just to get this out of the way, uh, I'm Chief Software Architect at Packetwork. Um, I'm, I'm a Dragonfly developer. I wrote libpeak, which is a bootstrapping code for user land networking. Um, so there's ISC li license code, um, which is a little bit more permissive than the BSD license. And if you are going to write a user land networking application, you might want to take a look because there's some code there that you're going to need and some more code that you will need eventually. Uh, minor contributions and a new BSD firewall project coming soon. If you're interested in this, um, let me know and find me on Twitter. So the status quo, as I said, everybody's doing it, but very few people talk about it. Uh, the minority shares viable open source code and um, that's not a good thing because I think that for the last six, seven years, people have not pushed in this direction and operating system lack considerably um, because of that. But we get into why later. Um, then there's a proud history of networking people undermining established system design, which is what this is all about. We need to get the kernel out of the way. We need to be uh, more flexible and so on. But we get into that on the next slide. And there is no standards API, um, only shared ideas across different hardware and different software with varying degrees of toolkit size, which means some toolkits, they provide the bare minimum and you have to write everything yourself. Other tools, they do everything for you so you have your application up and running in, I don't know, 30 minutes. Why do we do it? That's an interesting question. Um, the best one is speed. Not per, per se, but um, since the networking cards have gotten so fast, people ask, okay, now we can push 10G, 10G over this link, but why can we not process 10G? Um, we just want to do a little bit of routing. Um, then people go into the transport layer, application layer, and say, oh, we want to do have some proxy for HTTP and maybe something else on the side. Then they want, want to have mail gateways and so on. And it's a lot of stuff to do and the raw throughput from the network cards, um, it was built kind of like on, on, on top of the system level um, performance that, that could be pushed. So um, the actual computing power to do all these things um, comes after the cards have been released. And so it's always a struggle about speed. Um, another thing is complex architectures and code sizes may clock the kernel, cause panics, that's a very bad thing. Um, stack limitations inside the kernel, you cannot do a lot of things, you have to use malloc, malloc is bad for those kind of things. Multithreading is a lot easier, shared libraries, if you have, um, if you have a company and you need a deep packet inspection engine, then you go to a vendor and they only give you shared libraries. So what do you do? You have to get the packets to user space. Observing context and content on the application layer is becoming more and more important. Um, old school proxies are expensive and they don't really cope with the um, requirements that, that, that uh, modern, modern use cases have. 
Coding is faster and cheaper in userland. Um, I think that was one of the things that the RAM kernel people have also said. Um, debugging is easier. Eventually, uh, portability across operating systems, that's also something that people want. And um, kernel network stack protection, which is really interesting um, because if you grab the packets from the NIC directly, put them to user space, and then put them back, you can be sure that, uh, or at least you, you have the opportunity to, to verify that those packets are not malicious packets. You're protecting the kernel, you protect um, the applications that run on top of the kernel, and so on. So that's a good thing. Okay, here's my definition. Userland networking is a school of networking which moves as much of packet receive and send out of the kernel for performance and complexity reasons. It currently focuses more on transit traffic than endpoint traffic, but that may change again. Motivations are plenty, and um, it's not really clear what you want to do with it. It's, there's a specific use case, and you have to go for it. And then also the architecture and so on follows with that. Bottlenecks. So, um, modern networking is all about alleviating those bottlenecks. Um, and there's one inherent problem that's the weakest link uh, is the maximum performance in your system. So you always have to find it, identify it, try to fix it or, or circumvent it. And um, there are quite a few examples of why this happens. Um, the socket API is one of those things. Um, context switches in general, they are not cheap. Manual memory copies, uh, scheduling, IPC, mutexes, cache misses, memory allocation, boost speed, memory access rates, CPU frequency, basically everything and uh, eventually even your own production code is going to be too slow. Yeah, solving one problem just brings you to the next one. It's a never-ending story. One little example is get time, get time of day, um, which I would call a, a simple clock service fail, because you probably need the clock for something, even if it's just for, for accounting. And if you have the packet in user space, and then you try to, to pull the clock off the system, then you're going into a context switch and the maximum throughput of your system is going to decrease. So what can you do? You can, you can merge some calls for get time of day, but what then happens is kind of your, your, um, your notion of time, it, it, it skews, it skews, and that's not a good thing if you do accounting or, or traffic management or something like that because you need a precise clock all the time. So one solution is to just push uh, the timestamp through the packet code, through the framework itself, and then it magically just disappears as metadata for the packet. And the god mode is, uh, I know one company is doing this, they do timestamping on the hardware in nanosecond resolutions, which is something that you cannot achieve on similar BSD systems or on current BSD systems. So to reiterate, any syscall is bad, as it may yield the CPU, and causes an expensive context switch to happen. Concurrent processes are bad because they steal your precious CPU time. And any performance drop will then cause receive buffer to fill up and eventually cause packet drops. And you cannot get those packets back. Then there's this thing called zero copy. Everybody's talking about it. And um, it's really not zero copy not if you look at it from an outside perspective. Because you, you always end up with one copy into the memory um, from the network card, from maybe another virtual machine somewhere from user space, and this copy is fixed. And then there may be another one, I, it, it's, a little, it's just a little um, trick that I did there, and just say, if, if we're going into forward scenarios, then let's assume the packet was touched or uh, created, so in theory, you always end up with two memory copies, and these memory copies, uh, or if you have two memory copies, that's okay, but everything more than that is not good. And what most frameworks do, or what all the frameworks do, is they guarantee zero copy through all of their subsystems, but if you leave those subsystems, then you end up with another copy. 
and the important thing about copies is that it, it doesn't it doesn't seem so so obvious, but but uh, one of my mentors um, he said recently that if you think about when you copy every packet once that you receive, you end up with a full bandwidth of what you're actually coping with. So if you're on a 10G link and um, you're copying every packet, you're causing 10G of extra traffic through your system. And that's something that you also want to avoid. So what is the solution for zero copy? Memory mapping between user land and kernel. The kernel internally has done this for, for years and years with mbuffs and skbuffs. Um, basically, the kernel has a shared memory, one memory region, and so everything is okay there. But when we go to user space, we have different virtual addresses, um, different mappings, so then we have to use these memory mapping schemes to actually make the kernel buffers visible on, on a user land scope. The way you can do this is a contiguous buffers, ring buffers, which is um, simply you take, take packets off the wire and uh, put them into one big ring buffer. This works well if you only want to do receive. If you wanted to send, then uh, obviously you have to copy to the next buffer to send it. And to avoid that, um, NetMap, for example, uses uh, a ring slot approach in, in which rings are just they just provide, a, provide pointers to where the buffers lie, and the buffers are uh, like a global pool of packets, and they have one unique identifier. And when you do zero copy, you just take this reference and put it from one slot to the next slot. Another way to do it is book I.O., which um, DPDK does, for example. Um, it just uses a DMA to push the packets through a memory region, um, you tell it where you want packets, and then it just puts packets there magically and fetches them. All of this works great uh, between the NIC and userland, but there is one problem that people are trying to tackle, but, but, but we're not quite there yet, and we'll get into, into why this is. Um, if you want to push those packets back to the kernel afterwards, that's not easy, because then you again have to go into copies. From the framework side, um, there's DPDK. Um, everybody, I think, who's interested in this has heard of it. Um, it's a, a six-wind Intel uh, operation, mostly. The very good thing about this is it runs on Linux and FreeBSD. It's, B, it's BSD licensed, and its speed is unmatched, and it's very, very stable, high-quality framework. But it's also a low-level framework, so you cannot do a lot of a lot of the things that you, that you need for high traffic scenarios like uh, load balancing, uh, packet processing in general, there's, there's, there's nothing there and you have to come up with this yourself. And another drawback of, of DPDK is that it's only Intel hardware. Um, but Intel has 40G cards now. I don't know if you heard that. Then there's PF ring, zero copy, the zero copy version. Um, it's uh, written by the Entop people. Um, it runs on Linux only. Um, obviously, it's GPL uh, because of that. And this one has a really, really sleek API with a balancer. You just tell it, I want that many threads, and then the threads can just fetch packet after packet after packet. And they don't have to worry about the gory details, where they come from, where they, where they go if, if you send them along. And theoretically, um, like NetMap, it's cross-vendor but it only works on Intel drivers. And then there's NetMap, which I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about. Um, it's written by Luigi um, from the University of Pisa. Um, it was introduced in FreeBSD in 2011, and Linux code exists since, since last year, but um, as far as I know, it has never been merged the Linux people, they have some concerns about it. I don't understand it. Um, if anybody's interested, there are quite a few um, threads on LKML about this. The license is uh, BSD, which is good for, um, for any kind of business. Um, and the, 
the advantages of NetMap are it's broad, is it's broad driver support. In that case, it's not only Intel, um, it's Realtek and Chelsea as well. And on top of that, NetMap has an emulation mode, which means you can run it on top of any kind of hardware, even virtual devices, if they're configured correctly. Obviously, it's slower because it uses more copies, but it still works. If you're not concerned about speed in your implementation, just want to ship something um, on hardware that, that, that you don't possess or, or didn't buy, then you can still use this. And one of the drawbacks is that it uh, uses syscalls for synchroni synchronization, uh, which causes a few context switches to happen, but it's okay, I'd say. And the biggest drawback, uh, at least from my perspective, is that the API changes quite, uh, quite a bit from version to version, which comes in every six to nine months into, into FreeBSD. And then you're supposed, because it's a very low level API, and the wrappers are not that good for anything but packet capture. Uh, you have to rewrite your, your things, retest your things, and maybe even fix a couple of bugs that, that are left in NetMap because of, because of the rework. Because it's a, it's a complex piece of code. And um, why that is, we can, we can take a look at these boxes, I heard. There will be boxes. Um, the normal NetMap mode is what, what, what any kind of um, framework for user -land networking does. It grabs packets of the NIC, it has an abstraction layer, and inside this abstraction layer, the serial copy takes place. And then on top of that, in user space, you can run multi-threading third-party libraries, which is the most important thing um, from my perspective. And then you can put those packets back to another NIC and forward it. So you can actually implement a, a simple router in user space. Using, using this if you wanted to. What doesn't work, um, or what pre previously didn't work, was pushing packets along to the, to the kernel. Um, for that, NetMap has a transparent mode, which is a really, really cool thing. Because as you can see, um, you get the packets first. You can um, determine if they're bad or good, uh, whatever that means. And then afterwards, send them to the kernel, if they are OK. And then you can still invoke um, IP routing the packet filter, you can run applications on top, just like you normally would. And, and the rest of the system doesn't even know that NetMap is doing this. So that's, that's a really cool addition, just plugging, plugging in your extra applications. And there's one problem. Um, there's a bottleneck there. Um, leaving the NetMap layer and going into the kernel networking is obviously a memory copy from going from the NetMap slots to the MBUFs. Um, I'm, I have plans to change this if anybody's interested in working on this and helping to make NetMap native throughout the network stack, let me know. Okay, then architectures. Um, traditional, traditional use cases are routing, of course, which basically means looking at IP addresses deciding where to put, on which interface to put packets, and then just sending it along. Um, connecting endpoints is, is another one. Um, in this case, you don't have to go through the socket API, you can just, you can run your raw services on top, uh, which for example, for UDP is quite easy to do because you don't have to do any reassembly, you just dash out packets stateless. So that's a good use case. And of course, the capture and then maybe take a peek at the contents. Coming from these traditional use cases, packet receive is always great, but um, the transmit side isn't so good. Some APIs do this well, or frameworks do this well, others don't. You should be aware of this. And the user land scaling usually requires a load balancer for anything that's greater than one G of traffic. And then, maybe 10 years later, we're where we are now um, for, for modern use cases. And there, basically, what we want to do is take a peek at the full contents of the packet, and then maybe route, maybe load balance, maybe traffic shape, police, um, maybe look at even more of the content, do accounting, um, security applications, and so on. 
which also means that endpoints become less and less important and the forwarding scenario is the main mode of operation because um, you can kind of pick the traffic that you're interested in. You don't have to worry about ports, um, rerouting traffic somewhere. You just select the traffic that you're interested in, run your an an analysis on top, and then send it along, if it's okay. So all of these use cases are content context-driven. And the obvious buzzwords in that regard are IPS, next generation firewall, uh, unified traffic management, traffic managers, and so on and so on. What then happens with the stacks in user space is that it changes drastically. As you can see here, um, I put some statistics there which are just, just for reference, nothing scientific. Uh, the link layer is not really important, maybe for uh, which, inter which interface did this packet come from and which MAC address did it have. The network layer, we're only interested in, in addresses. It doesn't really matter if it's IPv4 or IPv6. It's just a container in that regard. Where it starts to get interesting is the transport layer, where we can actually tell this is a connection, this is another connection, this is a connection by some users, or one user has that, that amount of connections. What's also in there is, is TLS for, for men in the middle applications. That's um, something that companies have done for, for five, six years now, and also SSH, they, they're doing it. That's mostly for securing companies and uh, the tunnels. And then on top, the application layer. Um, in general, anything is interesting there. If, if it's HTTP, if it's FTP, mail, anything that is metadata, um, because customers come up with the weirdest use cases, and making all of those use cases possible in, in one product is quite a challenge, I'd say. So you need third-party software which can take care of different types of applications. So really, it's not one application layer anymore. You have a lot of slices of, of different applications on top of that. You can take them away, you can, you can plug them in. It's not a problem. So again, to reiterate, the focus is on connections, content, context, maybe even users, um, as opposed to simple routing decisions or providing endpoint access to a server. One other thing to keep in mind is that when you build such architectures, you're probably going to need a rules engine. Um, you'll have a lot of information and somehow you have to manage this, you have to operate this, you have to make this clear to the user um, or descriptive to the user. So um, the approach is describe something, um, the actual application takes care of the filtering, and then at the end you enforce policies, which could be a simple pass this traffic or block this traffic or this packet specifically. A um, couple of annotations here. If any, anybody's trying that, writing packet filter syntax. Um, hard coding doesn't really work. XML, also not a good idea. Writing good grammar is hard. Um, writing grammar that is very, very specific and very clean is even harder. And Jack Bison is always right. Remember that. Okay, and the last bit is um, how can we use user space networking? We, we know these applications um, for secure devices, for firewalls, but where can we go after that? And there's a talk coming up about user space um, network stacks, and this is a really, really great challenge for, for, for everybody, um, for, for privacy concerns. Um, because of this one simple fact. The internet, uh, the network layer is the base for our internet. We cannot touch this. Um, if we meddle with this layer, nothing will get through. Um, the application layer is already well defined and we don't have to worry about that. So we're not gonna change HTTP even though people are doing it right now. Yay. <laughs> and uh, that only leaves the transport layer for us to, to play around with. And right now that's a problem because Transport protocols are immutable because they are embedded into the kernel. 
and just telling end users to recompile the kernel because they have to do some tweaking on how TCP works is probably not a good idea. And also, the, the transport layer creates a, a backbone for today's inspection methods, uh, which basically means there are ports, there's ports information in there, and these ports are, are being used to track your connections. And why this is important is that user network stacks are more flexible, so we can um, actually recompile or plug in or make 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 some things dynamic, which means we can have more protocols, dialects of protocols non-standard encryption, obfuscation, renegotiation, and even end-to-end -end negotiation, or maybe out-of-band negotiation of features. Um, with that one, um, you can actually do the following. If you have two endpoints, and you agree on how the TCP header is going to be structured, meaning you, you're going to rearrange the TCP header, you're still talking TCP, the rest of the world will not understand you, but the connection tracking will completely fail for all the commercial applications that are out there. So that's a really cool chance for, for everybody to, to come together and write new transport layer protocols. That's it. Some reading material. And thank you. Questions? So the, 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 the question is, um, um, do the TCP connections stand out when we change this, and um, why not use some uh, encryption layers on top? Um, it, it's basically, it, it, what, what, what this approach does, it, it tries to disrupt the transport layer as opposed to um, going on top of the transport layer in which case um, most applications, um, DPI engines, they will tell you, okay, you're inside a tunnel, you're doing something, you're doing encryption, and worst case is somebody's not going to allow that. So you're stuck with that. And when you're just starting to rearrange some of the header fields, for example, with, um, it's, it's two bytes for, for, each, for each port, and uh, the actual uh, sequence number is four bytes. If you switch those fields, it will look like the ports are increasing, 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 and the connection tracking is completely out of whack. And then nobody can, or, or at, at first, nobody can, can, can track this. Of course, it needs to be adapted, but that's what the idea is about, adapting the stack, adapting the transport layer over and over and over again. Uh, yes, we have, a, we have a NetMap wrapper, which is, uh, I, I'd say, more convenient than the NetMap itself. It, it has gotten a, a rework um, last week. I think, and it works pretty well in all modes that, that NetMap provides. Even NetMap pipes, which is something that I, that I didn't cover here, um, NetMap pipes are like, like um, pipes on the, on the shell or in Unix systems where you, put, where you connect on both ends and you can send packets along, which is then obviously zero copy, so you can use this as inter-process communication queues, which is also funky. Um, the get time of day issue is something that the framework needs to take care of. It needs to provide metadata, metadata some small portion of, of inter-process communication along with a packet, because that, that, that's what you want. You want grab packets and get the metadata that, that's associated. Uh, no, that particular one was, was for Napa Tech cards. I know they do this very precisely. And it's, it's a good thing if the network card would do this because then you don't have to worry about it, you don't have to fetch the clock on your system, which, yeah. which might be skewed, and so on. It, they have different modes 